Hello, everybody. This is Ian Williams, president of the Foreign Press Association. And it gives us a great deal of pleasure to have here with, with us today, um, Lisa Napoli, who has um, been, as we've just been discussing, in the light of uh, the common dearth in the press of actual checks for writing articles, <laughs> is writing books and very good books. She's been covering them with lots of experience. So. This is the one that, uh, because I've read this one, we'll concentrate more on, but Lisa can throw in whatever she wants as much as possible. Uh, this is Up All Night, Ted Turner, CNN, and the Birth of 24-Hour News. Uh, and her other book, it's on the floor, you don't want to read, <laughs> is about the four women in NPR, which we'll, we, we can get to. And even more fascinating is um, her dispatches from Shangri-La, setting up a radio in Bhutan. I thought Shangri-La was in Washington, D.C. myself, but so I'm, I'm pleased it's transferred. Some people say it's Costco or Disney World. I guess it's all a personal, you know, frame of mind <laughs> where Shangri-La is. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the you know, it, reading your book made me think about it because living through these things, you don't see them happening, if you know what I mean. Yes, I do. Yes. I was always very dubious about CNN um, because it always struck me. It was like... Um, if you're as old as I am, you remember when newspapers used to have stop press. They used to have a little bit at the side where they could throw in the last piece of news, like the, the latest football score or the cricket score, or by the way, Japan lost the war or whatever, because the main print run had already gone out. So I always thought watching CNN was a bit like reading the stop press. It was meaningless unless you got the context elsewhere because you had all of these bits and um, I just, I've been on CNN a lot as well, so I don't want to denigrate it too much. But I've also been on its rival that came along, Fox News, mm -hmm. which was 24 hours not news and somewhat different experience. <laughs> and yeah. they, yeah. they had some of Ted Turner's showmanship, but uh, none of his um, accurate, none of his, well, I suppose, occasional predilections towards accuracy. <laughs> But I mean, reading the book with Ted, but with Ted Turner in mind, you realize all of the factors that we've overlooked now that AT&T had a complete phone monopoly at the time. It hadn't been bust. Yeah. That they controlled the wire that people had to go on. I was actually awake. I'm really showing my age now when the first Telstar came through. We had oh, recently wow. acquired a television, and I remember getting up and watching in black and white as the signals came over. It was a momentous occasion. It was like sort of the first, you know, it was, it was like the last dispatch from Kabul of the of the dead <laughs> of, of, of the dead regiment, you know, the guy coming through with the with the satellite uh, with the news. So I mean, I've lived through all of these, and it's only when you 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 help lend the perspective to it about what it takes that news doesn't happen now unless there's a camera to record it. Yes, yes. And, and, and I appreciated this during the Balkan Wars and the Falkland Wars and the others, because governments realised this as well and realised if they could keep the cameras out, it didn't happen. Right. You could massacre people off camera almost with impunity. You could yeah. take an embedded journalist on the Falklands, yomping with the British Marines, and no one would know what was happening. You could embed the journalist in Iraq. And as long as they didn't see and record people being shot up <laughs> at random, it didn't happen. So, right. I mean, th th this has had a big effect, but we still think the news is somehow solid. You know, I saw it on CNN. People used to come bursting into the Security Council at the UN and announce that they'd just seen something on CNN. And you think, surely governments have a better mean of, means of uh, sort of checking the state of the world than this. Uh, and just, just one final thing just reminded me that they set up an emergency response unit at the UN and somebody described this as four Fijian generals sitting around watching CNN, which was cruel, but essentially accurate. So tell us about your perspective on the 24 hour news and how um, somebody was frankly just this side of, um, let's say, there's an old Indian army saying not quite 16 hours to the rupee, like, uh, Ted Turner could pull off what was an amazingly successful stunt. And it was a stunt, like much of what Ted Turner did. And yes, I thank you for the context and introduction to all of that. I 
you know, I don't consume broadcasting, even though my last two books were about broadcasting, uh, because I, for all the reasons that you've just so well articulated, I, but I did start my career as a, as a teenager growing up in Brooklyn at CNN in its second year. And so thus my interest in, in it uh, as it approached its 40th anniversary, which happened last year. So I am less, in the book, I'm less concerned. I probably could have sold the book for a whole lot more money if it was about the polarizing force, the menacing force of 24 hour news. And the, you know, obviously Brian Stelter's book about Fox News was a huge bestseller, but that wasn't as interesting to me as looking at the roots of 24 hour news, how Ted Turner started it. And even though, as I say, I started my career there, I had no idea what I write about in that book that you held up uh, until I started digging in. And I think most of the people who enjoyed long careers there didn't realize where the news sprang, that, that news concept sprang up. And what's most interesting to me, Ian, was that Ted Turner was not only not a newsman, he wasn't a left-wing shill like everybody seems to think. Um, you know, they oh, no. oh, no. <laughs> hardly. He's the opposite of a left-wing shill, and um, a very colorful character. And as you point out, you know, if I had if I had gone to a publisher and said, "Look, I want to write a book about satellites and how satellites changed the world," it would have been an even harder sell than this book. But really what it was, it was satellites changed the world, especially once Ted Turner saw the power of them and uh, really was just looking for a, a proof of concept, if you will, about satellite and, and uh, cable, married to cable, which was also a very kind of wonky utility and not much more. And in his hand, uh, and in the hands of the other early pioneers of that married technology, it obviously changed the media landscape. And, you know, it helps that Ted Turner is this wild, uh, larger than life character to make it a really great story because all the people who joined him in this venture were also, were, were unlike him, dedicated news people who'd been looking for a way to beat the system that existed for so long before this technology made it possible to have news all the time. So. I, I found that a really interesting marriage of, of, of stories. Um, and I, I hope I told it well. I think, it's, I think it's important for us, especially those of us who are media people, uh, to understand the roots of how this wacky and atomized media world that we live in today came to be. I, you know, in about 20 something years ago, I was at the New York Times at a seminal moment in its history as it was, uh, as, as, as the newspaper world was becoming pummeled by the introduction of the web. And, uh, you know, of course, we're still seeing that after effect now. But then it was, it was a really important time for uh, media. But 20 years before that, even, even more seminal, because we were moving from this world of three, in this country, of three uh, networks that dominated broadcasting. Uh, both in radio and in television. So it's it's just been interesting to dig into the roots and understand our industry a little mm. bit better. It's, it's interesting how often if, from your book, it was a damn near run thing. I mean, there are times when he was putting his money and it was almost like he was on the verge of investing in Betamax instead of VHS, for example. Yeah. You know, <laughs> there's an equivalent of, of, of which dead ends you could go down. I love those stories about dead technologies, right? Or failed technologies, but you're right. I mean, about four or five times in the, in the rush to get on the air, and they did rush to get CNN on the air because they knew other channels were coming up and that they might not make it if they were not first. Um, you know, sort of, sort of that Yahoo, Google syndrome that we watched with the web uh, and all the other people who were jockeying for position with search engines back then. Uh, Basically, it almost didn't happen uh, because of financial reasons, because Ted Turner went missing at sea uh, in, in a yachting race. Uh, he was a, a celebrated yachtsman, some people may remember or know. Uh, the satellite that was supposed to bring this um, newfangled idea to people went missing at the last minute. Um, the UFOs, then, we know that now. <laughs> 
I think it was. It was Murdoch. It was a young <laughs> Rupert Murdoch who was somehow. Same thing. Same thing. Alien. <laughs> <laughs> Strange looking aliens. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But uh, and then he couldn't sell the biggest asset that he needed to sell to capitalize uh, capitalize CNN, which was a television station in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, because. He got in trouble um, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which was minority hiring issues. So uh, there'd been a clamp down on the license and he couldn't sell the asset that he needed to get the $20 million to launch this thing that people really thought was a crazy idea. Who would want to watch news all the time? And you know, also at that beginning in 1980, uh, there were only a million or so subscribers who would be able to receive CNN. Talk about a soft launch. Uh, luckily, one of them was Fidel Castro, which um, helped expand uh, Ted's horizons more internationally, but that's we can get to that later on. But yeah, so almost at every turn out of the gate. Oh, and someone had miscalculated what it would cost to hire people to staff a 24-hour venture, even though they were doing it in Atlanta, which was a non-union place. And so at the very last minute, they had to abandon plans to hire people who were skilled to work behind the scenes and instead hired a bunch of people who were just out of school, who they paid below minimum wage to. They call to, them interns now. Inter, right. Inter, that's, <laughs> that's what I wound up doing a couple of years later. Uh, the people flocked to work there because, you know, it was an exciting opportunity. The people who were a little, you know, wired differently and, and didn't mind leaving the media centers of this country to go to Atlanta and just, which was not the place it is today, um, not the world-class media city that it's become. So yeah, all these different things almost killed it before it even launched. Yeah, you could, you, I mean, from your description of the station when it opened, you can almost hear the, the roaches scampering across the, the sticky carpets. I mean, it's, it's quite, it's quite evocative. Well, the, it was, you know, if anybody remembers or ever was there, there was a, uh, it was, it was housed in an old Jewish country club in uh, Midtown Atlanta, which was raunchy beyond raunchy uh, then. And this campus was literally left for dead. It had been uh, in, in cahoots for a long time, I, or the city had been, th there'd been a developer who couldn't get it off the ground to turn it into an, uh, some sort of real estate uh, destination with hotels and, and apartments and stuff. So it literally was sitting there. It was literally inhabited by roaches and sad homeless people who crept inside. And so when Ted bought it, and they had to retrofit it in under a year to house not only CNN, but TBS, which was the thing that was, was keeping him financially going. There was wrestling above the news studio, live wrestling right above the news studio. But none of us knew really the history of this place when we went to work there, because there was no time to think about it. It was just, you know, crazy. Everyone listening to this knows it was a crazy mad dash to deadline. and. Ted Turner put a little apartment in there for himself in between marriages before he found Jane Fonda. And it was just, it was a really crazy, fascinating place that almost didn't happen. But how would you assess the quality of the news? Well, you know, it, it, it really does go, and I, I don't want to offend anyone, but it goes to what you think news is. And what was so interesting is that as his chief person, his president, uh, Ted Turner chose a newsman who'd come from the newsreels. Uh, he had a long history with movie tone news and working in, in, in the precursor to broadcast news, which was of course film. And so this man, Rhys Schoenfeld, who passed away a year or so ago, really was passionate about the idea of news not being packaged up uh, as it was on the nightly news with a, an announcer and, and film and, and edited and scripted. His idea was that news would unfold in front of you uh, the way it does today, uh, you know, news, if you could call it that. So his, his vision at a time when it wasn't technologically possible, uh, and again, nobody believed anybody would want to watch it, 
was that CNN would allow people to tune in and watch an event unfold before their very eyes without mediation or with only the mediation of someone you know, narrating what was what they were seeing before them. Uh, you know, I, as I said at the beginning, I don't want to watch news that way. I would rather sit with my nose in a book reading about history at this stage, but lots of people clearly find uh, the idea of watching briefings with officials or, you know, devastation or destruction. I would imagine right now there's a camera on that terrible incident in Miami with that building that just crumbled. Oh, wow. Right. I mean, I'm sure you can't get close to it for camera crews. I suspect. Yeah, I'm, exactly. No. And I and I, you know, I remember as a young field producer sitting in a field in Waco, Texas, and learning to be disgusted with the concept of, you know, this battery of cameras watching and waiting for people to die inside a compound where there was a man holding his, you know, cult followers hostage. So it for, for all intents and purposes. So I that's what Reese Schoenfeld wanted. He wanted, and it wasn't possible to People do it. People have forgotten it in, in those days. I think you mentioned that. I mean, certainly where I was, uh, I was I was making news as a demonstrator and uh, they had to rush their 16, 16 millimeter camera feed in, in, in a taxi <laughs> 30 miles from Liverpool to Manchester, develop it, put it online and uh, and that was instant. That, that that could possibly be the same day if they were quick and they, and, and they right. didn't crash on the way. Right. <laughs> and so it's completely changed our association with the news that you can that you don't have to do that as a creator of news. And uh, I think it's really important to remember that and to reflect on how that changed our perception exactly of what was news. Uh, and I give many instances of that in this book, including this idea that this little girl fell into a well. And that was the thing that really put CNN on the map as cable accelerated and became something more dominant in people's homes in the 1980s in this country. Uh, you know, more and more people had it. They were flipping through and looking for something to watch, you know, and there, there they would see a live camera, you know, trained on something. And that was arresting to them. And yes, that completely changed the definition of news from that time when you would, uh, you know, have to ferry film back. I, I talk about how the Queen of England, when she was um, coronated, how it was a mad dash by networks around the world uh, to figure out how to bring that news to people in real time as quickly as possible. Like when they used to wait on the Harbuck side in New York for the latest installment of Charles Dickens. <laughs> exactly. Is exactly. little Nell dead? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. And it, everything that we perceived about the world around us was different. I remember as a young woman working at, at CNN, this whole concept of, you know, we were, uniting the world we were you know the world was connected now because we you know people in other countries could tune in and see uh what was happening in a place way far away a place they'd never visit uh and it really was like getting the dispatch from the sea instantly while you were sitting on your couch and i don't know that that was good or bad but i wrote the book because i wanted people to think about it and talk about it so i welcome having the conversation with you now because i think it's really Certainly more compelling than watching a building and waiting is to see if a dead person gets hauled out of it. I mean, that's just a terrible, it has a terrible impact on our on our society that that's possible. But at the same time, of course, it's a terrific impact that we can dig deeper into, you know, the fact that that briefings and and you know, particularly with the president and our situation in the last years that it's more open theoretically than it was in the 70s before C-SPAN allowed us to peer into the inner workings of government. Um, I think you know there's benefits and problems with, with the technology, obviously, and the form. Well, well, CNN, it didn't get itself. It had thrust upon itself the reputation of being liberal. Yet on almost every count, Ted was not a liberal. He, he was staunch with the United Nations. He was big on the environment. 
he had rather liberal social attitudes, like he screwed everyone in sight. And yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's not, um, you know, it, 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 he, he was not your traditional Southern Baptist in that sense. He was open about it. He didn't do it furtively in toilet stalls like the rest of the GOP. Oh, no, no, unabashed. He'd do, yes, he'd do it in the corridor. Um, but I mean, how did he get it? Because even its earlier columnists and pundits were not exactly liberal cheerleaders. You know, uh, pa Patrick Buchanan was never one of the world's great liberals. I've well, been on shows with him and he, you know, I found him engaging and he, he would strike sparks because he had a certain integrity to him, even when you disagreed with him. But he was no liberal. How did CNN become the liberal TV show, TV channel? It's really important to remember that in 1980 and for, for CNN's first 16 years until Fox and MSNBC came along, it was, it was not a, a partisan world. The news slowly before our very eyes became a partisan world uh, and it, it became a partisan proposition to have a news channel once Fox and MSNBC came along. I always, I wrote a book earlier about McDonald's and the great philanthropist, Joan Kroc. And I always liken what happened in, in 24 hour news with what happened with the burger wars. In the earliest days of the burger wars, once there was this corporate concern that was bringing a little shack, hamburger shack across the nation, um, until there was competition or once there was competition, you had to come up with some sort of gimmick to make my burger look different than your burger. And that's exactly what happened with 24 hour news. Uh, CNN absolutely was not a partisan network. News was not considered a partisan network. But it was internationalist, network. which was it, from a it, conservative it, point of view, partisan. It, 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 it had a deal with the UN where it, by, it used UN footage, which was cheap and it was free from all over the world. And, it did environment. Barbara Pyle with the um, the Planeteers. Yes, yes, Captain, Captain Planet. Planeteers. Yeah, yeah. But remember, at that time, what was considered partisan was different than what is considered partisan now. Um, you know, now the environment has become this wildly partisan affair, which is crazy. But Ted Turner, first of all, had very little to do with the. Um, editorial content of CNN. He, he said, he even said from the very beginning that he didn't care about the news. And it was only because Fidel Castro invited him to, to come to Cuba and meet him because he was, Castro was such a fan of news, of 24 hour news, which he was pirating down there in Havana. Um, he invited Ted and Ted got this religion of internationalism that he did not have before. And um, that's when CNN started exploring the idea of relationships with entities uh, around the world and uh, introduced different kinds of principles to, to what it was covering. But it wasn't, it wasn't a partisan push. It was, no, one, no one at CNN saw it as a partisan push. What happened was when Fox and MSNBC came along, they all had to do something to differentiate themselves. And Fox out of the gate differentiated itself by calling itself, you know, wh whatever their ridiculous slogan is that we know isn't true. I worked at MSNBC in not the very beginning, but early on, and it was not a partisan place then either. For a long time or for a short while, CNN and MSNBC tried to toe the line and be what we older folk know as traditional news, which is representative of a diversity of opinion. But Fox pummeled the other two into having to choose something. Uh, what is it the stripper G Gypsy Rose Lee used to say? You got to have a gimmick. Um, Fox out of the gate was took one side. And so the others had to sort of pledge allegiance to another side to survive. And I don't think any of them necessarily really believe any of what they say. Uh, but I really shouldn't say that because, like I say, I don't really. Well, I think Fox that. believes it. <laughs> I've no, been on that. Always, I think they're true believers mostly. You do, but you always hear that a lot of the people who work there are just, you know. Uh, yeah. Oh sure, no. I mean, I I, I used I used to go on as the um, I, I used to see myself as the lion thrown to the Christians. They always had they, in the they old days have, when they were more balanced. They had me on them for rabid conservatives who beat up on me along with uh, O'Reilly and the others. But I, I could take it and it was fun. And uh, but, Yeah, I mean, we were good at it. 
<laughs> David Andal was making the point that uh, he claims he was in at the real birth of 24 hour news, 1965, when wins, when 24 hour news from top to, from top rock comment. That was, um, I don't think that was 65. I think that was a little bit later, uh, but, but I trust David's recognition of the year. But yes, definitely um, all news was, uh, people have corrected me on that with the title of this book, uh, that there was all news radio. And my new book about the birth of public radio, uh, which started in 1971, PBS uh, public television started a few years earlier. There were some people who, yeah, so maybe it was 65. I thought it was, I thought it was a little bit later that, um, that in two radio stations in New York, almost at the same David's time. David's correcting us. He says he was class of 66 at Columbia. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. So, and this was before. Uh, so 65 he, is the date. It's written in stone. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so it, the, W-I-N-S and then uh, CBS News Radio after that. Um, yes, okay, 65, 65, he's saying, okay. Um, anyhow, I got a little distracted, but yes, it's true. Radio was in the game. The difference too, of course, was that much of radio was taking from its resources of the, net, the networks. It was network radio, but yes, I'd love to hear more about what it was like at W-I-N-S at that time. As I say, there in this new book I wrote about uh, radio, there are people who came from CBS News Radio to work in public radio, which was also like CNN, not a guaranteed success out of the gate. But yeah, sorry. Okay, so <laughs> well, the, 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 getting back to it, we, we have to get to the quality. Um, Edna Perkins wants to know: Do you believe it's now information overload with TV and social media? Absolutely. There's no question about that. I mean, the idea that we all have a television studio in our hands with an, with an iPhone or a smartphone and can transmit information. Again, there are good things that come with it as well as many negative things. And it's incumbent on us as, as humans to choose what we consume. And I think it's very hard for a lot of people to do that. Um, it's, it's completely atomized the news business and the whole industry, and it's created many more jobs. In this new book, I write about how women couldn't get jobs in, in the 60s and 70s in, in any field, pretty much. But, you know, it was very hard for women to get jobs on the air um, or even bylines in newspapers, except for jobs that were relegated to the women's pages, you know, society and fashion, crap like that. So now there are you know, many, many jobs, many of them lower level jobs, many of them re rehash jobs, you know, rewriting. I remember being in the early days at CNN, recognizing that what we were doing was rewriting wire copy. We weren't doing journalism out in the field, which is what I wanted to do. It was rewriting wire copy that came over and thinking, okay, this is a strange concept that this is what people are then consuming in their homes around the world. So yeah, information overload, absolutely. But it's it's uh, it's it's makes it harder to consume. It's not necessarily. It's the a bit like Gresham's law. There's so much news, it devalues it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, you, you've got examples. Um, well, you know, there, there, there were British, uh, the British TV programs that did serious investigation and news uh, panorama. We had CBS sixty Minutes on this side of the Atlantic, and. Um, this is so somehow devalued by the 24-hour news cycle because yes. nobody's prepared to invest in, in looking into these things. They want it instantly off the shelf with no time to look at that background or do the investigation. Well, and what happened at CNN, I, I have seen happen in public radio too, which is CNN couldn't afford to have top flight documentarians going out and doing you know, fully formed pieces in its earliest days. I mean, that's what Reese's, Reese Schoenfeld's, the president's vision was, was just a live camera trained on something, not skilled, uh, you know, experienced uh, editorial people stitching together a story, either a three minute story or a half hour story. And so what they did to fill the time when there wasn't something to train the live camera on was hire commentators. And they hired out of the gate a raft of commentators um, who they would tape 
uh, editorials with, they called them, and they, they were taped and sitting on the shelf so that if there was downtime, they would run it. And they had commentators, by the way, from the right, like Phyllis Shafley, um, to left-wing people, Ralph Nader is one example. They had, I think it was 12 or 15 of them out of the gate on, on their roster. And what's happened in the news business is increasingly it's become a shouting match of opinion because it's much cheaper to have an author or somebody with an opinion on to talk for free than it is to hire you as a skilled journalist to put together a piece that would go on the air because obviously everybody listening to this knows it takes a lot to, to do that. It takes time, it takes money, it takes experience. Um, editing, et cetera. So that live component um, to fill in the blank of live news, you know, live on the scene news is, is people just yammering. And that really devalues the news. That's what's changed. There when was an archetypal moment did. last week. Did you see the guy who started, who's running the faux scare about, um, uh, about critical race theory when he confronted somebody who knew it? He just stood there looking astonished and he said, when when the other guy started talking about Hegelian discourse and, and oh gee you really know a lot about this don't you he's supposed to be the expert he's been brought on to mouth off and it's quite clear he's polaxed <laughs> polaxed with the truth <laughs> it's uh and 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 maybe it's like watching a fight uh people love to see a fight uh, i was walking down the street here in downtown la the other day and two people were fighting I was calling the police. Everybody else was standing around watching it. And I was worried that somebody was going to die. But that's sort of what television has become, uh, sadly. And, you know, you can thank or curse CNN for that. You'd probably, like David saying, W-I-N-S-2. Uh, but it ramped up in abundance, with abundance, after, after television came on the scene, cable television came on the scene. But on the plus side with CNN, they did go international. They did. Uh, they actually had a show about the United Nations at a time when the UN was instant on popularity everywhere across the US. The, the, yeah. the, they had a studio in the UN, and they. It was. It was Ted was. Let's say not interfering, but definitely encouraging. Richard right. Roth, Barbara Pyle, and the others to push environmental and um, international issues. I, I wasn't there then, so I don't know uh, exactly how much Ted got involved, but I do know that at the very beginning, it was decidedly, um, you know, Ted was decidedly not allowed. I see Alan Dodds, Frank is on, and he knows he knows about, I think, that era of, of CNN. CNN really took off and went global in 1990, Kieran Baker says. Yes, I mean, that's the first 10 years. Uh, this book is about the creation of CNN. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much about how it got accepted, but yes, in, in the Gulf, during the Gulf Wars, when it really got this international acceptance. And of course, again, it's very important to point out that cable couldn't have, no, no channel could have done what any of them ultimately did at the very beginning, because at the very beginning, the world was not interconnected the way it became. And of course, 1990 cemented this um, march of CNN into the public minds, public's mind as a news provider, uh, live news provider with um, the shuttle Challenger and Tiananmen Square and the Gulf War, the drama of the Gulf War. But of course, it's always important to remember that what you're seeing is that camera's view. You're not seeing um, a comprehensive view of everything around you. So Just, uh, reinforcing what you were saying, uh, I was the president of the UN correspondence in 1995. And to launch our annual media awards, which are still going uh, at the UN correspondence, we invited, we gave the prize for Ted Turner for his innovation in internationalizing things. He you know, couldn't turn up, he got Bernard Shaw to turn up instead. And Bernard was mostly famous for hiding under the bed as the as the American planes came into Baghdad. I was never quite sure this this, this wasn't you know quite uh, the type of heroism of the of the Soviet and German cameraman who ran ahead of the troops to take pictures of the people shooting at them, well, hiding under the bed in the Baghdad hotel, <laughs> commenting on the bombs coming. Well, it was not my idea of news heroism, but still, he accepted the award gracefully. 
sadly in our culture it's the celebrity who gets the accolades more often than you know the on air person or the celebrity who gets the accolades and you know ted turner accepted many awards for the creation of cnn um but he did not really he he put himself on the line to get cnn created but it was the people that i write about in this book who actually did create CNN. It's the same sort of thing with NPR, uh, which I write about in, in this new book too. It's, um, you know, anyway, it's a, that's a complex uh, situation. Bernard Shaw was a pioneer in the sense that, uh, you know, it, of course he was a very gracious anchor person and uh, it was a big deal that he was hired to be the marquee anchor person because at the time that he was, in 1980, it was extremely unusual for a person of color to be in that position. So, uh, and Reese Schoenfeld unabashedly said that he hired a number of people of color to uh, women uh, to be anchors at the very beginning because they were cheaper and they were willing to risk their <laughs> careers by coming to CNN because it wasn't a foregone conclusion that it would work. Bernard Shaw was working for ABC and he was you know, he thought about not leaving this plum job, but the idea that he would leave a place where there was a half hour of news every night to be the anchor of a place that was uh, on the air all the time, of course, for a news person was tantalizing. So, yeah, it's interesting. But it is, uh, we've got um, Edna Perkins again. What about the effects on Generation Z, I've got to say? Generation Z, really, but Generation Z. Should they pursue media as a career? How do you think it will evolve in future with the youth and bloggers? You said it's created lots and lots of work. Uh, those well, of us who are actually in the profession find that what it's created is lots of opportunities that don't pay. Well, no, and 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 like I say, a lot of it is re re uh, you're revising. I, I did. I went to some seminar on, on social media a couple of years ago, and there was a woman who stood up and said she wakes up every morning at four o'clock and she pitches 50 stories. And I said, how does anybody pitch 50 stories before, you know, seven o'clock in the morning? And her stories were hundred word stories that were rewriting stuff that she scouted on the web. And I thought, oh my God, no wonder I like writing history books. That's crazy. I mean, and I've had to do a lot of crazy things to support myself in my life, but that that idea that 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 tweeting or or writing. I've been approached by somebody who was offering me ten pound a story. Yeah, no, it's ter it's I'm terrible. I'm not switching my computer on for ten pound. Go away. It's, <laughs> it's terrible, but yeah, but if you were twenty five, you would do it so that you would so, so, yes. right. I mean, so you'd get the the credit, and it's it, yeah. So that's what I mean. It's created jobs that didn't exist before. When I worked at the New York Times, there was a whole section of people or, or ca job classification of people that didn't exist in the New York Times world before, um, which was basically digital journalists. I don't think they called them that, but it was, um, yeah, it, it, I, the, I forgot the question, but it's um, Gen Z. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just- Gen I Z, even, Gen Z. Yeah, I can't even imagine working in that world right now. But of course, if you're, you know, Christiane Amanpour or somebody of, of prominence, and it's a wonderful world and great, good for you. But for the rest of us, it's it's a really tough, mm -hmm. tough world. I well, mean, Simon Locke's mentioned about paywalls, which is one of the things. I mean, the news, there's more news than ever before, but you're to, we're talking about the selectivity, what's higher quality news. And, right. you know, certainly I would rather read The Economist or The Financial I, Times, <laughs> even though I don't agree. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, by the way, my 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 ex spouse always said that you should start reading it from the back because that way you don't allow the editorials to get you annoyed before you read the news with the well, Economist. But and that's the <laughs> obituary is the best part. No, and I just you know, unlike a lot of people, I like to read other points of view when they're well argued. You know, we get the Wall Street Journal here every day, and the New York Times. We get all kinds of papers. We're dead tree house. And uh, I, you know, I live with a man who's from Ethiopia. So he has a value for, he's Eritrean, he has a, a value for international news from a personal perspective. And so we read these things and we, we, we like well-reasoned arguments, even if we don't agree with them, but that's mm -hmm. hard to come by on television and radio. And uh, we just choose to read news and read it online, but that's us. I mean, 
But what worries me is that so many people don't agree with that uh, and, and are reactionary. And obviously that's what created this perfect storm of this horrible time that we've just lived through. So um, let's see. So Jim Laurie has got to come in. In the Washington suburb of Roslyn, Virginia in 1965, a station called WAVA created the first all news radio station. And they're all coming out the woodwork now to claim the prize. In 1967, they featured continuous live coverage of March on Pentagon against the Vietnam War, the only live coverage at the time. I think we can see why they didn't thrive. I mean, I agree with them, but I can see why they, this, this, this was not the path to commercial success. Well, but also I wonder, WAVA, um, it was bought by a, a Virginia newspaper. There, there was some pioneering work going on in what was called then educational radio. And the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom of 1963 was covered by this little now non-existent, not, and calling it a network makes it sound much more grand than it actually was, of educational radio stations up the Eastern seaboard. One was in DC, one was in Boston, GBH. Um, and the one in DC was AMU, WAMU. And this is, like I say, way before uh, President Johnson or President Johnson's Public Broadcasting Act. And they covered, they have a comprehensive website. If I could find it right now, I'd post it. Of, of their audio coverage of the Washington March on the Jobs in Washington, of March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, the famous MLK speech, uh, I Have a Dream. So there was innovation going on all over the place. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of it's lost to history. So I want to look that up. That looks really interesting. There was another person in the Capitol around that time or a little bit afterwards who was also longing and experimenting with ways of bringing more comprehensive uh, coverage of the uh, of, of you know government uh, to the people, but it was extremely hard to do. That's the, that's the great thing: the democratization of all of the uh, new technologies make it possible. You know, Reese Schoenfeld couldn't have done what he did with Ted Turner and Ted Turner's money uh, be, because. The average person couldn't have accessed that kind of capital uh, back at a time when that was necessary. And now here we are talking from my living room with my little $40 microphone over, uh, you know, over Zoom. So it's a different world and it's got a lot of benefits, but it's also got many, many negatives. Part of the attitude is the fact that no matter which system it's on, you, you mentioned all of the all of the three networks. Basically, it was the same people in suits reading drastically truncated news, all the news that they fit to see to print. And uh, and it was very rare to get any sort of comprehensive edge in there. I'm thinking you mentioned WGBH uh, and um, I was thinking of Danny Schechter, who was running. Oh, yes. D D Dan Danny, of course, was doing a, a, a show on South, South Africa. He did Democracy Now. He did South Africa Now which NPR carried a little bit. And then he did Human Rights Now, I believe it was. NPR Damn. told him they didn't think human rights was a sufficient organizing principle for a, oh. TV, for a, for a TV show. Uh, so, I mean, you know, NPR have uh, feet of very muddy clay as well on these issues. They share oh. all of the old patrician attitudes. Ab well, and it's important to point out too that, that Danny Schechter was an early producer at CNN. He worked at CNN in the very earliest days. My my, it's been a, a couple of years now since I was immersed in the book. But he, I, I read his book in the writing of my book about CNN, and he talks about scuffles he had then. But it's also important to point out that that um, someone who is now deceased, um, Robert Zelnick, worked at NPR in the '70s, in NPR's earliest days when nobody knew what it was, and he fought to get Pauline Frederick, who'd been put out to pasture by NBC. I think was the last broadcast network she worked for. She was a pioneering woman journalist in her day, which was extremely unusual. That she covered the birth of the United Nations and then continued to cover the United Nations for so long that people associated her with the United Nations. Um, when Dag Hammarskjöld died in the plane crash, they wrote her notes of condolence because that's how closely 
as associated she was in the mind of the American people. But nonetheless, she'd been put out to pasture by M NBC because she reached the age of 65. And of course, the fact that she'd even existed on television at all, much less that late it's into an anomaly. the <laughs> was shocking. And Bob Zelnick at NPR called her up and said, I want to do a show, a weekly show with you. And of course, they paid her a pittance. I want to do a weekly show with you as the the star where we talk about international issues. And the only reason that they were able to get it approved was because it was Pauline Frederick who was famously connected to the UN and international issues. So it was a big get for NPR, which is a non-starter at that point. It was hardly, I can't remember how few people who how few people could tune in, but it was not the powerhouse it is today. But it, it, you know, it eventually petered out for exactly the reason you pointed out, which was, oh, well, who cares? International, oh, who cares? Now, of course, now they'd all congratulate themselves for their vast international coverage. But then in the 70s, there were all kinds of studies done that showed that Americans didn't care about international news. So they didn't want it in their broadcasting. You know, if they were going to read it, they would read these old guard dead tree things. Well, we didn't call it that then. They didn't expect it from broadcasting. So yes, point being, it was a different world. It's a very different world now. And um, yeah, I'm not sure which one I'm happier to be living in, but we're- Well, we're since, since, you're, since you're in at the birth of uh, the current era, is, is, is there a new world of birthing out there or is, is it all, all, going to, all going to hell in, in that basket? Well, you know, that's that's what happens when you get old, right? You think everything's going yeah, to hell yeah. in a handbasket. <laughs> but, and it is. It is going to hell in a handbasket. But now, of course, if you read anything, you see all of the stuff about um, podcasting is going to kill public radio. It's going to kill everything. And, you know, an old colleague of mine from Marketplace and public radio got hired to be director of audio today at the Washington Post. The Washington Post has a director of audio. It's a different world. It's um, it's an expansive and and wild wild world and you know we called it the wild west when the web was coming up and i think it's still the wild west and here i am in the wild west and i don't know you know we have to worry about water and droughts and earthquakes and it's uh that's annoying. i do find it annoying when i do a, a, i'm searching for news and i find an item in say the washington post or the new york times and i can't read it i'm supposed to sit through a stupid podcast and and listen to it and watch it. It's not an efficient means of transmitting news. <laughs> not, not for us, but we're old. So I think, you know, the youngsters want to hear it. Uh, or some people, I, I shouldn't be ageist, because I don't think it is just an age thing. I think some people do want, you know, I hear so many people who, who go for their daily walk and listen to last night's All Things Considered. Um, that's, that's just not me. But it, I guess it's great that you can get so much when when at your pleasure, when you want it, not just have to wait till 6.30. I don't know. I don't know. Well, that, know. that's the other part. I mean, one of the genuine steps forward is uh, the enterprising young lady who filmed. George Floyd, yes. Flo Flo Floyd George's uh, murder. Um, yeah. she, she should be getting a job with somebody right away. Uh, you know, because what she was doing was subversive, accurate, it was public duty, uh, right. and it was citizen journalism at, at, at its best and most effective. Right, right. And it would, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it wouldn't have been possible for her to do that. She would have been simply an eyewitness. So yes, it's a, it's a, it's a super, super, these tools are super um when they're used well and like any tool you know it's like alcohol super until it's abused um it, it's you know it's a complicated world and my goal was to look at the history and make people think about how this world we're in now evolved because i you know with npr too i was surprised that like like cnn it almost didn't happen and it almost didn't fly and how do these famous women who are iconic and, and associated with it so indelibly come to be? They almost didn't get jobs because women almost couldn't get jobs, or didn't, often didn't get jobs in, in those days, so. Mm, and double disabilities, uh, Christian Aumbo, I mean, a Muslim sounding name, <laughs> vaguely Middle Eastern looking and a woman. I mean, how could she be there? She, and she was exactly what CNN was looking for 
when they gave her her first on-air job. But yeah, if you read, um, there's a super book by Sheila Weller called The News Sorority. And it's a super mini biography of her, um, Diane Sawyer, and I think it's Katie Couric is the third. I can't remember the third, someone correct me. But uh, the, the story of Christiane Amanpour was that she couldn't find work because of her accent in this country. And, but CNN loved her because of her accent and her looks because they were going international and that was exactly what they needed and, and wanted. So um, yeah, and so a great, a great star was born. Let's hope for us all with our strange accents yet. <laughs> I overcame my Brooklyn accent and I wish I hadn't. It would have served me so well. Uh, well um... Where, where do we go from here? I mean, we, we have, I, I said uh, that now uh, nothing happens unless there's a camera there. To, to do it. But what can we do when we have a society where governments don't seem to mind that there are pictures of their atrocities, that all across this country, there are body cameras on police and bystanders, and they keep on beating people up regardless. I mean, is, yeah. is, what am I missing in this equation? If, you know, if, if they're caught in the spotlight and they still do it, you can only imagine what they do when the cameras are off. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I don't know if you remember this, but I do. When um, when video games were start, first starting to be a home concern, you know, not something you had to play in a in our, an arcade. Actually, even then, there were all kinds of concerns about whether violent video games were making people violent, you know, especially kids. Are, did kids have the capacity to shoot something up on a screen repeatedly and then, you know, function as normal people? And I think that there's something to the concerns that were expressed many years ago that, um, you know, I don't think people want to hear it or acknowledge that it, after, after watching uh, violence after violence after violence, both on, you know, and Ted, this is, by the way, one of Ted Turner's things in the 70s. He was very angry about how there was a proliferation of violent, violence on television and in the movies. Um, mm -hmm. That part of his conservatism, that uh, he wanted feel good kinds of uh, offerings. He thought Robert E. Lee was the bee's knees. <laughs> But, but really, I think that people don't want to have the conversation about the impact of what we see on the screen uh, deadening, if you will, our capacity to understand that what we're seeing is bad um, or has an impact on us uh, in some way. So I, to your point, I would, I would suggest, I'm no sociologist and probably people study it. I'm sure people study it that um, seeing, seeing something time and time again makes you, uh, somehow incapacitates us as humans. It dulls the edge, certainly. Yeah. Sure. It's got to. Yeah, yeah. It's, so. um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it, <laughs> when you see that degree of gratuitous violence over and over again, you don't get as angry about it as you should do. Right, exactly, exactly. So I, I, would, I would suggest that there's an association, but um, I'm, I'm a historian now, and that's, I'm looking back as much as I'm looking forward uh, to, to make sense of now, I think, is, is, or to make, make my place in the world make a little bit more sense. I don't know. The other part is actually holding people to, to account. I mean, American television is very deferential to authority figures. The British much less so. I mean, you know, the, the British know their deference and the, the slimy two-faced blank blanks when they're on the conservative side, but they don't mind putting the boot in on a politician if they think he's wrong. Here, people seem to be almost scared to challenge people in authority, whether it's the chief executive of a company that's just polluted a, a whole watershed, or whether it's the president who's uh, manifestly lying through his teeth, as, as certain presidents have been alleged to do lately. <laughs> We've, I've, so I've heard, yes. No, I think that, I think that the problem is that the PAC journalism is, is a big issue. Um, you know, you do what your colleagues around you do. And Twitter somehow seems to liberate people. It's like a stream of consciousness mm -hmm. of ugliness or challenge. 
Um, but it's hard for people to do it face to face, especially if their colleague isn't doing it. And the minute their colleague does it, they feel that they can do it. Uh, I, I covered a, a one presidential race as a field producer in, in television, uh, 92 uh, Clinton. And it was, um, it was actually fascinating. Uh, but I, it, it convinced me that I didn't want to work in Washington because that, that pack mentality was just... Well, we, we saw it during the Iraq war. Very, very few of yes. us. Yes. Uh, Danny Schechter and I were amongst them who said, hey, the evidence isn't there. Saddam Hussein is a bastard, but you've got no evidence that he's got weapons. And that was completely drowned out because once the pack had decided, then you really were risking your pension if you stood and said, no, hold on, guys. This guy's not dead. You know, you can't, you can't do this. And it, 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 the pack mentality is very worrying. And that's, that's independent of the technology, isn't it? I think it is. I think it is. It's just that the technology has enabled there to be a bigger pack covering. I mean, the, CNN's challenge in its earliest days was getting to be part of the pack. They, they sued for the rights to be included in the network. It's a big four, yeah. That had um, had the stranglehold over what we as people got to see and hear about our government, and that was back when television was limited. Uh, news was limited to just a couple, a half hour every day. Um, I, I, I try to avoid Twitter, but I've noticed on the feed lately the um, so-called critical race theory. It's it's a bit like the snark is a boojum, you see, if ever you find it but it's flooded with people who haven't a clue what it's about and shouting about it. <laughs> shouting you don't about know it. what it is. You know, it, it, it's hunting the snark. <laughs> that's, that's what the they snark should. The snark was a boojum, you see. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, Twitter. Wow. Yeah, it's, um, it's okay. made everybody an expert. Yes. We're all epidemiologists now <laughs> after the pandemic. I, how many yeah. times did I say that? Yeah, during the pandemic. Well, if you saw today's know. news that uh, the president was actually almost dead and was still denying it. Yes. Oh, yes. Right. And still not wearing a mask. But we are coming to the end now. I'm sorry. Um, this has been a, well, I've enjoyed it. I hope, uh, <laughs> hope the rest of everybody did. You know where to get the book. Yeah, just get in touch with us and we'll, we will pa pass you on to uh, Lisa and her publicist. And uh, she'll be happy to give you an interview in person, I'm sure. And, yep. um, you know, get out there. And there's, journalists don't make money from journalists anymore. They make it from books. So buy them, buy them. You know, it's, it's the retired journalist pension fund. <laughs> you've, you've, got to, you've got to buy the books. <laughs> we don't even make money if you buy the book anyway. But uh, we make money when the publisher buys the book. But still... <laughs> I hope you'll read the book or all of my books. The one about Bhutan is 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 perhaps relevant as well, and they're all out there at libraries, ebooks, audiobooks. I read them myself, so uh, if you want me to read you a book or story, please check out one of my four books. I'd be so grateful, and I'm so grateful to you and to my friend Tracy Kwan for for making this happen. Really, really a pleasure. Well, thank you very much, Lisa, Jamie.